नमस्कार रवि जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन सो लाइक विद एवरी वन एल्स आई लाइक टू आस्क फर्स्टली वॉट इज योर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ और रेकलेक्शन ऑफ और एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ नॉन वायलेंस जय राम जी की माई अर्लीस्ट रेकलेक्शन गोज बैक टू वेन आई वॉज अ वेरी यंग किड वी हैड वन फैमिली मेंबर माई मदर्स चाचा who had been involved in the freedom movement and was a follower of gandhi and one of the things that he uh, made us kind of opened our eyes was that you don't hit children okay and even when we had done something absolutely horrendous in the house and he was around his parting comment to my parents was don't hit them after i leave okay and much later there were other incidents with him uh would you like to see who is this gentleman yes please here we go so here is gandhi ji the train has arrived at lahore station it should be around 1920 and uh, the gentleman on the right of mahatma gandhi is my mother's chacha okay so his association with gandhi ji lasted for 27 odd years right and within this within our family he commanded tremendous respect for his simple life very simple life his high values and therefore he became like a role model okay and so that's my earliest exposure to non violence mm. uh, later in 62 um i got exposed to a lecture by um, raj mohan and that was very exciting that day i made a decision that i have to go for nation building when you went to iit bombay to become an engineer was that did you see that also as a step in your ambition or your your wish to be part of nation building and of somehow doing it through non violence by then i would honestly admit that uh, the idea of nation building um, had somewhat receded uh, from the foreground but uh you may remember that the mid 1960s were a time of tremendous suffering in india with uh, droughts and floods mm? so once again um, having been exposed to the social service league at xavier's college then we thought why not do something of the sort at iit and once again the idea of social service as engineers came to the foreground i became involved with freya and freya became a major movement on first on the iit campus then it spread across the country when dunu took it over you know dunu roy right yes and uh, dunu converted that student involvement program into a national program which also caught the attention of jayprakash narayan theek hai so then from then onwards there was no looking back but i mean this was also the time when nakshalbari happened around yeah. this late 60s and yeah. we know i know that uh, the influence of nakshalbari nakshalite movement the idea of a, a violent revolution that would uh, finally solve the problems of the working class in india this was very much in the air what uh were you why were you not tempted to join that okay you i i and India. i sorry let me rephrase was it yeah. your commitment to non violence that uh, kept you away from that movement no 1968 i left india to go abroad to the us for doing a phd okay and naxal bari had just basically began to take roots in 67 68 so there was very little exposure to the naxal movement for myself 
Secondly, you must remember that coming from a middle class family, son of a bureaucrat, uh, a school teacher, principal, uh, you don't think of these things ordinarily unless your social circle is also thinking of it. And that wasn't my social circle at that time. Can you spell out what FRIA was? It, I think it was an acronym, right? Yeah. Front for Rapid Economic Advancement of India. So then in the U.S., how did your worldview shape up? I mean, in, uh, particularly on this issue of the legitimacy of violence versus nonviolence as, as a method of change. Yeah, so I reached the U.S. in September 1968 at the height of the anti-war movement. The Democratic Convention in Chicago had just finished. And there was a lot of anti-war protest in the US. Uh, I came across a student, uh, John Schreiber, at Rutgers University. And he had been a straight A student who just a few weeks before his finals dropped out of studies. And he and I began to interact quite a bit. Uh, we, he became an, a, a, a very fond of uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti. And then I got exposed to the whole concept of the violence of ideas, okay, the way we are uh, brought up. But my real exposure to uh, violence and nonviolence came in 1975 after the imposition of the emergency in India. Uh, we set up something called Indians for Democracy. And we had a lot of discussion on what would be the values of this Indians for Democracy. In that, one of the criteria for being a member of uh, IFD was that you have to make a commitment to nonviolent action. Okay. Also, nonviolent uh, in thought. Now, I came in contact with a number of American Gandhians, take Horace Alexander, who'd been with Gandhiji in India before. Uh, 47. Then there was the George uh, and Lillian Willoughby's. And George and Lillian said that, look, we are not instinctively nonviolent. Nonviolence is something that has to be understood gradually and practiced. If you don't practice it in your daily life, then it remains an, uh, an intellectual concept. Okay. So uh, to me, that was a very big lesson. And I learned that you have to go through a period of preparation. Now, even though the Willoughby's ran these nonviolent action training camps and so on, I never went to their training camps. But the idea took root in my head. And it got strengthened um, when I decided uh, there was a very strong anti-war movement, which was, uh, which had taken the shape of not paying war taxes. And I decided I'll never take a job uh, where I make so much money <laughs> that I have to pay an income tax. If I don't have to pay an income tax, I'm not contributing to the war effort. Okay. So that was another major uh, decision. And then uh, 76, I ran into Joe, my wife to be, as you probably know, we ran into each other because I was on a walk for human rights. And um, let me show you, maybe I have that. One second. I may have a picture. Yeah. Can you, can you see this? Yes. Walk for human rights. Uh-huh. No, you, I, you need to, is, there, is there something written at the bottom? Ah, now can yes. you see? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I did not come back with a little America in my head. I came back knowing fully well that I'm going to work in India on the issue of poverty. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Ravi, but very early in, uh, in, early in your time back in India, I, I remember that you were very much in the center of the relief work and the prevention work when there was mass violence 
in 1984 against Sikhs in Delhi following the assassination of Indira Gandhi. In what ways did that traumatic uh, event and experience shape your understanding of both violence and non-violence? Well, I mean, 1984, uh, I showed up at Ames Hospital within probably half an hour or an hour of Mrs. Gandhi's uh, being brought over there. And um, already you could see a lot of people beginning to collect outside the hospital. Um, slogan shouting started by the time I left the hospital. Early next morning when I was returning home, uh, I saw a lot of buses burnt on the roadside. And uh, I was a bit surprised. Then my friend Poonam Mutreja called me and said, uh, you know, we are gathering at um, uh, Sumanto's house, uh, some of us, and let us try and do something about this violence that is taking place in Delhi. We gathered, we then went around the city trying to collect other people. And one of the persons we collected with us was Swami Agnivesh, who was a good friend. Um, on the way back, we found uh, young kids um, looting some shops in Lajpat Nagar market, stopped the Jeep. Swami Agnivesh got up on a makeshift pedestal, started to talk about, you're not destroying this shop, you're destroying the country. So, you know, we had a, we had collected about 25, 30 people at Lajpat Bhavan uh, that evening. We had a talk and then we got a message saying, well, they burnt the Gurdwara uh, in the neighborhood. We went out there and then they said, Look, we'll take care of this Gurdwara. You please go to the Lashpat Nagar market where a lot of violence is taking place. So once again, Agnivesh gets up and starts telling people that, look, uh, this is going to result in something much worse and you better stop. This was followed by an idea that we would organize a peace march the next day. And... Um, I spoke with Chandrasekhar that night and Chandrasekhar said, Kal subhe mujhe batana kya sthiti hai aur agar aisi hi halat rahi to phir uh, puri uh, kal hamari national executive ki meeting hai to hum meeting cancel karke tumhare saath chalenge. So next day, here we are walking through Lajpat Nagar with this huge crowd of politicians, Farooq Abdullah, Madhu Dandavate, God knows who all were there. And um, we are, I had taken them past the burnt Gurdwara and we are going through a narrow lane. All of a sudden, a horde of young men comes running down the lane uh, towards us with knives and swords in their hands. Now this was absolutely you know stunning the walk suddenly halted and i grabbed the hands of the two people on my sides and i said look we've got to stand firm together and just as i was grabbing the hands poonam who was walking behind me she said you get back and so she brought three women in front and said we'll confront them but Strangely, just as our minds were getting made up to confront this, strangely, a military column came by with a white flag. They were doing a flag march. And as soon as the uh, young men saw the military coming, they just disappeared. So uh, that was kind of a, uh, you can call it a, a moment of quick thinking and I can't really say scary because I, it was split second response ki ab to marna hai lekin marenge yahi par. So that was my confrontation in 84 and after that we got involved with the relief effort 
and worked with thousands and thousands. We at one stage we had fifty thousand uh, refugee, homeless, uh, Sikh uh, in our uh, camps. This is the biggest relief effort. Yeah. And I would say that the citizens of Delhi uh, rose up to help them. We did not have any problems of funding. Yeah. Manju Bharatram was there from morning till evening, helping us, uh, you know, sort out clothes and utensils and food stuff and whatnot. Jaya Jaitley, H.P. Nanda saying almost every other day to Poonam, Aaj kya chahiye So it was a very... Uh, invigorating effort and I would say something like 600 volunteers a day. Yeah. Ravi, have, have things changed in these last 36 years in the sense that uh, no, I'm deliberately asking the question in that innocent manner because I, I, I want us to look at it clinically. I think, I think the change, to my mind, the change really started uh, in the 70s, early 70s, uh, Sanjay Gandhi came to the forefront and Sanjay Gandhi put forth this notion that there's nothing wrong in making money. Okay, there's nothing wrong in getting rich, whereas the whole Gandhian tradition had been voluntary poverty. Okay, then Later, Dhirubhai Ambani emerges on the scene in uh, 1980 and says, I'm going to help you become rich. Um, so those are the starting phases. And you know that there was that violence of the emergency. Then comes the Bhivandi riots, the, um, the uh, 84 Delhi riots, then the Meerut riots, etc. So every now and then you have this successive violence. But I think another major turning point was uh, the Manmohan Singh uh, era, beginning in 1992. Hmm? Manmohan Singh ji led the country into this period of LPG period, liberalization, privatization, globalization. And from that day onwards, the younger generation, which I would say for the first 40 years or 35, 40 years of independence was focused on um, doing something for the poor, became more focused on the self. Okay. And um, how do I get ahead? Dhirubhai Ambani's um, technique that I'm going to help you become rich had, I think, taken hold of the minds of a lot of people. And you know, the whole stock market um, business and so on. Uh, so I would say that's the world began to change. And we began to change. We decided that we'd give up that whole Gandhian notion, the whole socialist notion, and we'd embrace um, capitalism wholesale. And that capitalism, interestingly, most interestingly, where does the money come from? It comes from nature. It comes from exploiting our natural resources. Okay. Which includes people. Which includes people suffer as a result. Because this is very interesting. Normally, wars were fought with invaders. What were the invaders coming from? To loot something that you had. Okay. So one country fights with another country so it can establish its hold over some other country's natural resources, right? Here, what we saw was that as, it is, as capitalism begins to take roots, that people's ownership of natural resources in their 
in their immediate environment begins to be snatched away from them to the person who's going to generate profits in which we are going to get a small share. Okay, so that kind of violence became um, statecraft. This understanding of capitalism as a form of violence against the natural world, was this instrumental in your decision to uh, form the People's Science Institute? Uh, no. You know, Rajni, I'm not a theoretician. I'm an engineer by training and a doer by instinct. Okay. Um, much of my thinking tends to be intuitive. Huh? Uh, see, the People Science Institute, since I decided that when I return to India, I will be working uh, on issues of uh, removing poverty. As an engineer, what would I think of? I thought of appropriate technology. Schumacher's ideas were also floating around Gandhi's uh, uh, and Kumar Appa's ideas of uh, the permanence of economy and so on. Uh, these were, these had already sort of uh, appealed to me. And so I thought of People Science Institute in very practical terms. I said, जो डॉक्टर लोग हैं वो गांव में जाके अपनी डॉक्टरी का फायदा उठा रहे हैं लॉयर्स आर हेल्पिंग विद लीगल एड टीचर्स एजुकेशनिस्ट आर हेल्पिंग विद अल्टरनेट एजुकेशन आइडियाज व्हाट विल वी डू एज इंजीनियर्स ओके वी विल सेट अप पीपल साइंस इंस्टीट्यूट एज अ सेंटर ऑफ एक्सीलेंस व्हिच विल कीप इट्स डोर्स ओपन टू कॉमन पीपल अनलाइक द ऑफिशियल गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशंस uh we will provide our services to the poor and for poverty removal it was as simple as that initially the credit must go to anil anil agarwal anil and i ran and i had gone to england um as a working honeymoon by the way uh to collect literature for a course on appropriate technology that i was going to run for uh students from the third world okay and i anil had was working in london and i ran into him we talked about uh, common interests and he talked about environment he'd been exposed to the chipko movement uh was his turning point and when he talked about the chipko movement i began to realize that i had poofed this whole business of environmental destruction because to me it was more of an uh, elitist idea jo log america mein reh rahe hain unko ye industry wagera ki zarurat nahi lagti hai to wo iski khilafat kar rahe hain hamare desh mein to aisi sthiti nahi hai hamare wahan to garibi hai garibi industry has a role to play etc etc very mundane ideas and uh, anil said no the environmental movement in india is completely different you come back and you will understand and on my uh, return here i um, met people like chandi prashad bhat uh, who influenced my thinking a lot i met sundarlal ji also but it was bhat ji that i was drawn closer to and then i began to realize that the lives of people in india particularly in the rural areas is totally dependent on their immediate environment so they get their firewood they get the fodder from the forest if you chop down the forest how are they going to live there okay if you submerge the forest they can't live there huh? they get their water from the ground right and even in the urban areas you remember this was the time of antule's infamous effort to drive the poor out of bombay right so aap kisi ki jhuggi jhopdi tod dein unki to aajivika puri khatam ho gayi na you throw them outside the city how are they going to earn their livelihood so it became very clear that the indian thinking on environment was completely different from the western thinking okay and 
you know, my interest was in uh, rural development, poverty removal. So it fit in very nicely with that interest. That's how, for me, environment became a very critical issue. And I joined Anil at the Center for Science and Environment. Okay? Yeah. Ravi, you, I know that you were not, uh, in that sense, uh, at the forefront of Chipko when it first happened. But would you like yeah. to say something here about that movement? Because it has been seen as a combination of both spontaneous nonviolence and also uh, a leadership that uh, encouraged the people to opt for a nonviolent resistance to the destruction of their environment. So could you say something about that period and how you saw that dynamic? Well, I will tell you what I have learned in various conversations with uh, Bhatji and some of the people who, who were with him at that time. Um, you see, Uttarakhand had a tradition of peasant revolts. And many of the peasant revolts were centered around the rights over forests. Hmm? Now, Bhatji was a very ordinary person, as he says. He was a conductor in a bus company. Hmm? But the turning point in his life was a uh, lecture by Jayaprakash Narayan. That day, he decided he would become a follower of Gandhiji. Then he goes to Varanasi. He's trained by Nirmala Deshpande. Okay. So once again, that Willoughby's idea that you can't just intuitively rush into nonviolence gets borne out over here. Yeah. And when the when the, uh, they decided, the villagers decided to uh, oppose the, the um, forest um, cutting, forest felling, they consciously chose nonviolent resistance as a tactical, strategic way of countering the violence of the woodcutters. Hmm. Now, all this happens in the background. Dead people talk, people discuss, ki kaise karenge, ye hoga, wo hoga. these are all conversations going on. But somewhere it must have seeped into the subconscious of the people who are involved in those discussions. And um, Gora Devi's action was most likely a very spontaneous action. Right? But behind that spontaneity, lies, this is embedded somewhere in that spontaneity. This is also a way to oppose the violence. And this is something that was then Bhatji and his colleagues would organize these eco-development camps and so on. And many people would come from all over the country and get exposed to these ideas. Okay? Yeah. Does the idea still have currency that JP made famous? JP made the idea or the slogan famous that uh, no matter how we are attacked, we will not retaliate with violence. Hamla chahe jaisa hoga, haath hamara nahi uthega. Do you still find that that kind of sentiment, maybe not in those words, but in its essence, do you still find it alive in the society that you are working with in the Himalayas? Dekho bhai, Chipko Bagara ka jo logon ko jo unka gaurav tha usme, wo to dhima pad gaya hai. The younger generation doesn't even know what the Chipko Andolan was all about. What was very often you can go to the villages and you can talk to kids who are about um, high school age, and you can ask them, Aapne Chipko ka naam suna hai? and they look at you. Aapne kabhi 
भट जी का नाम सुना है मोर पीपल सीम टू हैव हर्ड ऑफ गौरा देवी ओके दैट्स इंटरेस्टिंग एंड इफ दे हैव हैड सम लेसन इन द क्लास देन दे माइट नो एक्टिविज्म इज ऑन द वे बट देर आर स्टिल यू नो पीपल अराउंड हु आर इन देर फिफ्टीज एंड सिक्सटीज एंड late 40s who still remember the chipko era and when they come out and usually they are still out on the streets uh, in protest they raise these slogans ki hum haath nahi uthayenge hamla jaisa marzi ho hum haath nahi uthayenge these are their uh, these slogans you can still hear in our state for example there is the uttarakhand mahila manch they are very clear about this yeah okay they were at the forefront of the uttarakhand andolan that's okay? right so this is a good point ravi for you to now talk about the more recent movements that you have been part of both to save the rivers in the himalayas and other different kinds of environmental degradation so maybe if you could first say something about what is the scale of that devastation that is happening and uh, how people are resisting it and why they choose to do it largely through non violence okay um, i think the first major uh, resistance uh, if you can call it that i wouldn't really call it that the first big uh, recognition that the current uh, pattern of development is going to destroy us came with the um decision to build a large number of dams in the state 450 dams were planned across the state this is uttarakhand uttarakhand and the people's reaction initially is not so much to the save the river the reaction is ki hame displace kar diya jayega bandh banega to we all seen what happened with the tiri dam so that that issue is well understood and well known tiri dam is one of the largest storage dams in the country hmm? and it led to the Uh, its uh, its area is about 42 square kilometers it led to the submergence of hundreds of villages and the town of tiri in which which was the um, seat of the tiri state and has a very old tradition and history okay uh, the badrinath temple uh, the raja of tiri is the keeper of the uh, badrinath temple is the not the keeper but the um, patron of the badrinath temple so the tiri uh, household had a very uh, strong uh, following in the state but uh, when thousands of people were displaced by a dam that was coming up on a major fault line and lot of ge geologists etc scientists were opposed to it uh, unfortunately the dam got built and people were promised all kinds of things some were given some were not given so the the general understanding is that the local people lost out and lost out heavily okay one of the fears expressed by the geologists at that time was that this dam the constant filling and lowering of the water level is going to lead to landslides in the perimeter of the dam and that has been happening as far back as 2009 four years after the uh, couple of years after the commissioning of the dam the supreme court had to order the relocation of uh i think 27 villages because they were now being threatened by the loss of land uh, landslides were taking place so now when the new program starts off after the formation of uttarakhand state people are worried 
कि आ, हमारे यहाँ अगर बांध बनेगा तो क्या होगा द आंसर टू दैट बाय द स्टेट वाज वी आर नॉट गोइंग फॉर लार्ज डैम्स नाउ वी आर गोइंग फॉर रन ऑफ द रिवर डैम्स नाउ दिस वाज अ फ्रेज पॉपुलराइज्ड बाय सुंदरलाल जी एंड पीपल लाइक अस एट सी रन ऑफ द रिवर अनफॉर्चुनेटली रन ऑफ द रिवर वी नेवर अंडरस्टूड वॉट वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट run of the river are essentially diversion dams you stop the water behind a dam push it through the mountain bring it down the slope and drop it 5 10 15 20 kilometers downstream at a power house okay so you get a lot of drop uh, it's called a head at the site which enables you to generate a lot of power with less water now the stretch between the dam and the power house several kilometers just goes dry totally dry we don't leave any water uh, flowing so rivers began to dry up and some rivers that had a number of dams on them had literally became uh, ponds behind the dams connected by these tunnels pipelines okay yeah and you know people's uh, to build approach roads to build the colonies for laborers and so on lot of forests were cut down and that's why women came to the forefront to oppose these dams okay once again uh, people realize ki bhai ye to bahut badi company hai sarkar bhi iske piche hai to hum kaise ladenge inke khilaf hamare paas shakti kya hai that's where non violence steps in okay the idea is that acha wo chipko andolan mein gaurav devi ne aise kiya tha hum bhi dharna karenge so dharna becomes a very popular uh, mode of opposition yeah. and this movement had both spiritual and moral support from gd agarwal who was a former yeah. te- he was our your teacher i believe right no he was not directly my teacher but he was one of the three founders of freya there you are so can you hear briefly tell us the story of how gd agarwal basically gave up his life for this cause and do you see that as a form of non violence that i leave it to scholars and thinkers like you i keep telling you i'm a doer i'm not a thinker um uh, see gd grew up not far away from the banks of ganga river he is um born in kandla and then which is closer to yamuna but uh, he's growing up years formative years as a student were also spent in um uh, muzaffarnagar he studied at roorki also bachpan mein unki दादी उनको लेके जाती थी गंगा किनारे और गंगा की कहानियां सुनाती थी और गंगा क्यों पूजनीय है ये समझाती थी सो दैट्स व्हेन दिफॉर्मेटिव आइडियाज टू रूट्स इन हिज हेड ओके मच लेटर ऑफ कोर्स ही टॉट पीपल सिविल इंजीनियरिंग ही टॉट डैम बिल्डिंग इनफैक्ट ही रैन अ टूटोरियल for the engineers at the maneri bhali dam which was the first dam on the bhagirathi uh, upstream of uh, uttarkashi okay so at that stage he had no idea of what would happen to the river hmm? it was only in 2007 when he made a trip to gangotri and he saw that there were several dams now coming up that he had suddenly realized that the river is going to disappear and that's when his childhood knowledge came to the forefront that's when he began to uh, commit himself i remember him telling 2007 after the trip uh, he came back and he uh, he was by then i think the chairman of people science institute and he came to psi and said kya ho raha hai aajkal and i said sir aajkal to ek nadi bachao andolan ki baat abhiyan ki baat chal rahi hai 
अच्छा क्या कर रहे हो सो आई टोल्ड एम अबाउट दिस होल इशू दैट हैड रिजन वी वर टोटली अन अवेयर ऑफ इट एंड then he narrated his story of how he had been up to gangotri and seen all this and he said uh mujhe to agar apni jaan deni hogi to main to apni jaan de dunga so he it was a very firm but quick decision on his part he said look i have achieved everything in life i don't have any children i don't have a family to speak of and it's people like me who should be ready to give up their lives not the younger people and thereafter bit by bit he built up his uh, resistance so 2008 i remember he came to the nadi bachao andolans um, um, state wide meeting uh, he then announced his uh, in uh, april he announced his first fast right June he began his first fast uh, in Uttar Kashi, and thereafter, you know, bit by bit, he built up the pressure. And each time, he was quite clear and adamant that if it results in my death, so be it. Okay. In the process, a lot got accomplished. You know. at least now there's a token uh, genuflection towards the river we call it our national river hmm kam se kam ye to hai uh, the concept that every dam should have enough water flowing downstream so that the river ecology doesn't get destroyed the idea of environmental flows um has taken root I remember the first high-level expert group that was set up in two thousand eight to devise uh, some principles for uh, what was it called for maintaining the pristine and uninterrupted flow of the Ganga. And the meeting that takes place, I was there as GD's nominee, um, was. how do we sustain enough water flow in the river and i mentioned environmental flows nobody in the room really knew what environmental flows are okay it was that i mean we were totally oblivious of these what ideas. year was this ravi 2008 okay first meeting july yeah and gd agarwal yeah. uh, can you just briefly say how he died well um in february 2018 he wrote a letter to uh the prime minister saying that you know we had a lot of hopes from you and um uh, since you regard ganga as your mother and i regard her as my mother we are almost brothers and as an older brother i'm writing to you this letter in great pain that you know you said a lot of good things but you haven't delivered and so now i want you to deliver on these four things and if you don't then i will begin a fast unto death on ganga dasera day well the the letter wasn't even acknowledged i think he wrote another letter my memory is now not very sharp i think he wrote another letter but finally he did begin his fast and aap manoge nahi ki halanki bahut se log judne lage unke sath us samay sarkar ki or se kuch nahi hua the government began to respond despite a lot of pressure despite a lot of interaction with the a uh, senior leadership of the rss and the government and government officials etc despite these personal interventions and so on the official uh, reaction of the government was too little and too late and uh, in september on september 9th i think uh, gd announced that navratri shay 9 tarikh ko नहीं नवरात्रे शुरू होंगे फलानी तारीख को और फिर मैं पानी पीना भी बंद कर दूंगा 
I was on my way to uh, Rishikesh to see him at the hospital when I got the news that he had already passed away. But that was GD. Dhrid Nishche. Or ek baad thaan li man mein to phir kisi ki baat ni sunni. Well, at a time when so many people are willing to kill other people to, you know, get their idea <laughs> at the forefront, uh, this kind of supreme self-sacrifice, does it inspire people, do you think? Does it uh, energize a kind of constructive activism? Uh, do, do you get that feeling? Or... I mean, how do you see this sacrifice? You, you know, okay. It's like the way I understand it is that people, lakhs and lakhs of people can never sustain a movement for very long. Okay. Now you look at Gandhiji. Uh, uh, Non-cooperation, early 20s. Civil disobedience 10 years later, 10 years later comes Quit India movement. In between, what is Gandhiji doing? Constructive action, right? To keep, to keep people together, the activist crowd together. At the larger mass, the ideas seep into the subconscious. People are going to go about their daily routines. They have a life to live. And so they go about their... These ideas get embedded. Hmm? And when the objective conditions are such, they are ripe, then these ideas will flower again. The only thing is that this applies also to the dark energies. The same logic also serves yeah, but, but the remember, forces of hatred. But remember hmm. that the instinct for survival is probably one of the strongest human instincts, at least the way I look at it. It's one of the strongest human instincts. And what we have done by, um, you know, I often tell uh, my colleagues and students that, um, you know, Mother Nature has tremendous capacity to absorb the violent actions of her wayward children. Okay. But there is a limit to her patience, her absorption capacity. And when she can't bear it anymore, she reacts. And then she reacts in a very destructive manner. We saw that um, whole Kedarnath uh, tragedy in 2013. We are seeing a lot of um, uh, floods and cyclones and hurricanes across the world with increasing fury and um, uh, frequency. And I think abhi jo garmi ki maar padne wali hai, wo bhi padi nahi. Jab Jaga jaga par 50 degree centigrade daily temperature ho jayega and people will start dying of, um, of heat. The heat waves which are at the moment they are largely localized in I would say places like Katak and Bhuvaneshwar etc. Jahan bahut garmi pad jati hai uh, kuch samay ke liye. But this is going to be a global phenomenon. Yeah. Europe and all yeah. are witnessing it. The forest fires in California, in Australia. So okay, this will so make us think again. Young people can see these links now, but many of them are floundering about how they should respond. What can they do about it? Um, so uh, particularly for the young person who has to get on with a pretty much uh, normal life, who is not a full-time activist, what what is some of the things that you, they can do to, to stem this violence against Mother Earth? They are doing it already. That's the good huh. news. You know, when when Freya me jab ham logo ne poverty ke khilaf kam karne ka socha, do you think we had any idea of what is poverty? 
do you think we had any idea of why people are poor we were all urban people brought up in comfortable middle class homes right we knew nothing about all this once you get involved with honesty then you begin to ask the right questions and get the right answers and that's what guides your uh, actions okay now just to give you a small example um, the government announced that uh, dehradun airport is going to be expanded into an international airport and so they are going to cut down 10000 trees in the adjoining forest last week a few thousand young people college students were out there marching ye hamare samay ka chipko hai so you know they'll find the answers they'll find them but what are the odds on those answers veering towards non violence and versus violence and anger and hatred bhai violence to bahut hogi pehle lekin violence sabse pehle nature ki hogi okay this is what we are seeing now and which is why this consciousness is seeping into the young minds i mean they are, they are recognizing ki yaar hamari to pura hamara to pura jeevan baki hai ye sab to humne jhelna hai in buddhon ne kya karna hai ye budde kuch nahi karenge hmm? so i think they are very clear about it and um, nature's violence is going to overwhelm human violence of course there will be human violence as people try to hold on to whatever they have okay so it's we are in for a very difficult time and i remember when i went to the us i was so surprised people used to actually they used to have these uh, bomb shelters in, under their basements they used to stock goods over there kyun russia may invade us people young kids in the us in the 60s were really scared you know and that's also part of the reason for the anti war movement so these ideas they get embedded in the mind and i uh, people say i'm basically an optimist but that's how i look at the future ki ha pehle bahut hi dukh aur dard hoga lekin ultimately the human race wants to survive bahut bahut shukriya thank you so much